um, in the teachings of Buddha, uh, one of the important uh, pillars is what's known as the Four Noble Truths. And they are essentially um, statements. Um, and if you look at them a certain way, if um, you know, your seeing comes to see the seeking, understand the seeking from one's own change, um, then you know things like Bible stories or or parables are heard a bit differently. They're often heard as metaphors. Deeper meaning is um, is heard in what is said. Um, they can be seen from sort of from outside. Um, in that you can agree with them in a sense instead of wondering what they're saying. Um, so you can hear the the message differently. Um, and often it's about not taking things literally but metaphorically and, and um, our mind stepping outside of the box and how it interprets things. So, you know, if we hear about... Um, I was speaking with someone recently and they said that they have now understood that the um, the historic story of um, the Jews escaping or leaving from um, from Egypt and they were they were leaving from those that were keeping them in bondage their captors um, and she said she suddenly saw that differently as a in a way a metaphor for us moving away from that which keeps us in bondage rather than literally a person or a race escaping from another race although literally that's what the story is if you listen to it literally um, and so anyway, the Four Noble Truths are statements and in fact the way I hear them is that they are um, explanations or descriptions of the unfolding of the seeking. Uh, so the first Noble Truth is life is suffering. The second Noble Truth is there is a way out of suffering. The third noble truth is understanding the way out of suffering. And so on. So I wanted to focus on the first noble truth. Um, life is suffering, is a realization. It's an appreciation, something we have to um, acknowledge in a way as seekers. When a seeker starts seeking in a way they haven't even started, if the first noble truth isn't recognized, it's about seeing things as it is. Um, and similarly, the same sort of principle is in the 12 step program you know there's this resistance of someone who comes in uh you know an, an addict goes into the 12 step, step program and they have to be able to stand up and say hi my name is so and so and i am an addict um and the reason that that is such a significant um milestone is because most people start off not being able to say that they're addicts that are saying i'm not an addict and so then they're going in the program and they're saying well you know you guys might be addicts but i'm not an addict i'm here because um of whatever the reason is and so until there's that acknowledgement they haven't even started the program uh and so it, it it's not exactly the same, but it's important for us to look at the first noble truth. Life is suffering as a, 
um, a realization and acknowledgement of the human condition. The human condition prior to liberation um, is suffering. Now, why is this useful? Um, well, one reason it's useful is that if you find yourself suffering, you don't need to feel like Robinson Crusoe. If you find yourself suffering, you... Oh, just for the sake of clarity, Robinson Crusoe, because um, <laughs> it might be a cultural thing, um, was basically you know, an explorer finding new things, the, um, the only one to have visited certain places, an explorer. All right. And so my point is that if you find yourself suffering, you're not the only one. Um, in fact, it's the human condition. And that can be a great relief for us to realize that we're not doing it wrong, that when suffering is there, it's not because I'm doing it wrong, it's because life is suffering. And one of the big um, forms of resistance before seeking and even during seeking is the non-acceptance of suffering, the insisting, the struggle against suffering um, for it to be not suffering. Now, we need to understand why, and the reason is that suffering is... Um, it's uncomfortableness, it's an uncomfortableness on the level of self. So not even, like, like there's pain, right? And so pain is an uncomfortableness or a painfulness on the level of um, the body. And the suffering is an uncomfortableness on the level of our, the core that we know ourselves as. So I wouldn't, it's not what we can refer to as our true nature, and it's useful to talk about true nature, although in the moment when suffering or the, when that's our condition, the human conditioning, the, the human condition, um, there is this uncomfortableness on the level of, um, how we know know ourself um and so it's very hard to accept it, it it's not about hard like oh if you try really hard you'll be able to accept it's impossible because it's an uncomfortableness on the very it's it's an uncomfortableness inside your being and so the resistance the wanting it to be different and all of that, it's, it's inevitable. It stems out of that uncomfortableness. And <clears throat> only as the seeking progresses, and what I mean by the seeking progresses is that as seeking progresses, our structure essentially, or um, what is produced changes. And so, as the internal um, experience changes, then there can possibly be a, a time when the suffering has changed in uh, structure such that there can be a, an acceptance, a witnessing of it, a, a resignation to it. Now, what that can seem like is, oh, it's the same suffering that was always there, and now there is someone that is accepting it. it on, on the surface, it will feel like that, but my suggestion is it's a different suffering because the one that is witnessing it or the one that is accepting it is really not separate from the suffering. So if we take a different view and we look at it as a single 
a single experience. The involvement in the suffering, which is when the suffering is very intense, is a certain color. Let's call it gray. It's all gray. There's suffering and the involvement in the suffering, which is more suffering, and suffering is uncomfortableness, and so it's just uncomfortableness. And then some other time, what I'm suggesting will be as we have moved through certain phases of seeking, there is still uncomfortableness arising, but there seems to be a, a bit of space available. Now, that bit of space feels like, oh, I am choosing to not get involved in the suffering. But if we um, step out and we stop thinking of a me that is separate from the feelings and we just look at experience in the moment what what i'm suggesting is this experience of witnessing the suffering is a different color to the gray it is gray with let's say a lighter um, boundary to it but you know i've described it as two colors so then our mind says oh well there's um, the gray and then there's the white and the white is you know the me doing the acceptance but really um, the gray and the white are not <laughs> two colors <laughs> they are in the metaphor but they're a, a different overall color so gray white <laughs> versus gray uh, and so the the witnessing is is happening because the experience of who we are is changing. Now, what is it that makes it change? And um, on the one hand, we can say it's all a mystery. We, we can't explain anything. That's useful. Um, that's a useful concept because we have such a tendency of thinking that we absolutely know how to explain everything. And so that attitude of um, thinking that life is as we, as it appears, and as we've um, as we've interpreted it, keeps us uh, bound. So we come across a teaching a concept that says, you know, life doesn't happen anything like um, we think. And any explanation we have is completely off. Um, and so you're better off just saying, I don't know. I don't know why um, change happens. Um, now, these things are not absolute. Uh, these statements that, you know, we can't explain why. Um, as I said, it's a very useful concept. And so for a certain period, we'll take it on as absolute because we will realize that, oh, I've always been saying it happens because of this. That, oh, I now think differently because of a book I read. Um, and what if it's not because of that? What if life actually doesn't happen because of causality? And um, maybe we feel a certain way because of dynamics that are completely hidden from us. Um, and so if we, if, if this lands and we realize that we are convinced that things happen a certain way, then um, for a period of time, the thought might arise, it might keep arising and says, I don't know. I don't know why this happens. And what that thought will will essentially be doing is interfering with um, a pattern that until that realization happened was unseen as being mm, limited and potentially a form of bondage. So it wasn't seen as that. And once um, it's seen that, yes, this is how I function and actually maybe life isn't like it appears and like I've concluded, like um, we interpret 
it to be. And so we decide, okay, I'm going to stop insisting it is. And then this thought, I don't know, keeps coming up when we have a tendency to revert back to, oh, you know, this happened because you did that, um, and therefore I have to hate you or, or whatever the story we go into. The thought might come up and go, I don't know. We d you don't know. Like, you don't know sort of your thinking, speaking to yourself that comes in and says, you don't know that that's how this happened and that that shouldn't have happened. Maybe it will lead to something good. Anyway, we just keep saying, I don't know. And, and that can bring us to a a place of quietude because it essentially undermines the thinking that says I do know this is how life is and I feel terrible um, and uncomfortable with seeing life this way and we haven't even realized that you know <laughs> the seeing of life the way that we're sure it is tends to include in it an uncomfortableness an entity that is really um, part and parcel of that belief of who we are and what life is. And, um, and there's the suffering in it. So if, if something comes in and cuts off, starts to cut off the habitual way of uh, thinking, and it cuts off, in, um, inevitably it's going to cut off the suffering because the suffering is part of that thinking. So each time the I don't know comes in, if it happens to get us to be quiet, essentially. When I mean be quiet, I don't mean to stop moving and stop making noise, but for the thinking to just stop. Now, when you look at what's happening, it's actually the intellect that... And so there are two parts of the intellect. There's the the working mind intellect. Uh, there's the functional intellect, which is the working mind. And then there's the psychological or the thinking mind. And the psychological thinking mind is essentially the thinking of the psychological me that takes life very personally. It's the essentially the human condition I was talking about, um, which is why life is suffering um, because that identity that entity which you know we f um, know ourselves as a very concrete uh, physical entity essentially however um just uh, one second. We have some technical issues again. So we know ourselves as a uh, essentially a, a physical um, sense being, um, and maybe haven't realised how powerful thought is at creating um, a sense of self. So uh, a sense of our sense of self the psychological self um, is essentially a set of beliefs and thoughts and ideas about who we are, how we, de how we define ourselves, what is valuable to us, um, all of our shoulds and shouldn'ts, our goals in life, our 
um, judgments of ourselves and the other, uh, the experiences um, th that have made us form certain conclusions. And that tends to get wound um, and put in place very early in life and gets wound stronger and stronger, tighter and tighter, um, basically every day, every hour, we are adding new layers onto that identity and most of the new layers are confirming um, the original layers that have been put in place. Um, and we don't consciously put them in place, they sort of get put in place um, by the um, type of person we are, our genes and, and our ongoing conditioning. Um, and so we form the, the psychological identity along with the biological aspects of the human get formed and we, we there is a human experience which is a result of what has got formed and so we tend to um, maybe not realize that what feels very concrete as who I am is maybe not as concrete as it seems, why it feels concrete, as I'm pointing out, is that it is a very tightly, tightly wound and layer upon layer upon layer upon layer identity. However, things in life, especially if we're exposed to certain new ideas, um, can crack that belief system wide open um, and essentially start dissolving what feels very concrete um, quite, quite efficiently. Um, now this is why we sometimes hear suffering is not real. Now when it's an illusion or... Um, now if that's misunderstood it can be taken as, as though the person is... Um, being insensitive or doesn't have empathy is um, bypassing or transcending the human experience. And that often does happen if someone um, has seen through certain, um, or not even seen through, but had certain parts of their sense of self sort of fall away, um, but doesn't necessarily have a very integrated understanding, their response to someone else that is not them can be quite um, lacking in understanding um, and can be quite inappropriate given where that other person is and what they are feeling, if there isn't an appreciation, if there isn't the capacity to put oneself in their shoes, then what is often put forward is where that person stands and um, inevitably that is going to change, it's going to be refined, it's going to be integrated um, and yet the response, the description of life put forward by that person m might be as if that is the be all and end all, that where they currently stand is, is it. And so um, we often hear uh, seekers that have had certain realizations d dismissing suffering as illusion. Now, if we can appreciate why it is illusion, so putting aside that, um, you know, a seeker that is in process saying it, and if we hear a teacher um, who is integrated saying it, it is not necessarily bypassing. What they're trying to point out is how it is illusory or they, they might not be trying to explain it but we can maybe appreciate what is at the bottom of that statement that suffering doesn't exist or suffering is illusion um, and the reason that that's being said is because the very identity that is suffering is a set of beliefs that is layered upon layered upon layered very deeply ingrained and and concentrated, not because we did that, but rather because that happened and we are that, we are a result of what has happened. Um, and so it's just the human condition. 
Um, it's what life has produced. So we're a work in progress. Um, and if we appreciate how what we know ourselves as may not be as concrete as it feels, we, and we might appreciate this by recognizing and seeing when some new information comes in and shatters a belief. And when a belief is shattered, which essentially means we realize, I believe this when I have no real good reason to know it. And yet, I hold it in my system as if I know it absolutely. Um, and usually when we see this incongruence, that's when the belief um, falls away or starts to get uh, weaker and weaker. Until that time, we are holding it as if it's absolute because we can't see that it's not. Um, and so it gets um, put in place. So a, an appreciation of of this means that we'll see that what I am is not as real. And when I'm talking about what I am here, I'm t we're talking about this identity with its, I its solid fixed ideas about life, about who it is, about how life should unfold, about what um, I should or shouldn't do, about what enlightenment is, about how, um, you know, a, a meaning what a meaningful life is, whether we should contribute to society or whether we should um, this or that. And that can feel very concrete. And yet new information can come in, gets us thinking, and the thinking exposes these beliefs and they can fall away so if a belief can just fall away can no longer be part of who you are and yet it was part of who you are then we can have this epiphany that who am i really am i a set of beliefs that are subjective not absolute thought-based um, and this is quite impressive if we see that it's it's quite it's a significant um, uh, aspect of liberation it's why liberation is available because we can be liberated from ourself if our self the self that is in place falls away so this notion of dying before you die refers to the dying of that psychological self that has been put in place. And what the dying of that self means is it's the dis dissolving of it, the, um, the falling away of, for example, an idea, deeply, deeply ingrained idea, which I call a belief, that says, you know, I have to and fill in the blanks um, that if I'm not doing this X, Y, Z um, during my week, then I'm wasting my time or I'm being lazy or I'm uh, stagnating. So we could have that belief and it can hang around for 50, 60 years but at any moment, even when we're 20, only 21 years old, that can be popped and go, well, who says that um, life is about doing hard labor? Or who says that life is not about doing anything? So two opposite ideas, and someone could have one or the other of those. And we might suddenly realize, who says that I have to... Um, do what my parents said was important? Who says that I have to do what a government says is important? Who says I don't? Um, you know, we might realize that there are no real absolutes um, 
and a stepping outside of that can then open up a world of possibility now if that happens if this world of possibility gets opened up essentially the identity that says i have to do life this way has dissolved and it could easily have been that identity or it was that identity that when it wasn't functioning according to its shoulds and its shouldn'ts was then suffering as a result and so if that identity has fallen away in a similar situation to previously when suffering may have arisen the suffering may not arise because it um, the circumstance is not being judged relative to this deeply ingrained sense of who I am. And so if the suffering no longer arises because the story about the circumstance is now one of flow or acceptance, at least not one of uncomfortableness and resistance, then we can look back in hindsight and say, wow, that suffering was not fundamentally um, real, as in it wasn't there regardless of something like attitude, for example. If it was fundamentally real, it, it isn't going to change because of changing your attitude. If something is fundamental, fundamentally real, it has an independent um, existence and it is not changing. And so um, that then means we start to um, look at these phenomena a little differently. We start to um, understand, oh, my suffering, which feels very real, is actually all based on an identity that has been put in place that can change in any moment. And that if it changes, then the suffering, which is always a response, an attitude to a circumstance, will be different. And um, if it stops arising altogether, that's when we realize that suffering fundamentally isn't real. Now, we shouldn't, um, what that means, what when we're saying suffering is not real, it needs to be kept in in a healthy context because if it isn't, what we might mistakenly think or overlook is that even though it's not fundamentally real, in practical terms, it feels and is experienced extremely... Um, uh, vividly and it is extreme uncomfortableness so we don't want um, that concept and a concept that stems from a realization that suffering is actually impermanent and it's not fundamentally real we don't want that to <clears throat> um, become an obstacle to empathy an obstacle to understanding the human condition <clears throat> and appreciating that for all intents and purposes when someone is suffering it feels very real and it may not be appropriate to reply or respond to them or to even have the attitude that oh get over it suffering is not real um, <clears throat> because it's real and it's unreal these realizations are not absolutisms um, they <clears throat> are always correct from a certain point of view. That's why I'm trying to explain it um, <clears throat> and explain why that statement is accurate and at the same time why that statement can be inappropriate and, and essentially inaccurate also because for all intents and purposes, suffering is real and it's also, as I've described, unreal. <clears throat> Anyway, liberation is available because essentially the um, identity can fall away and with it the suffering that used to be so standard um, falls away. So <clears throat> what, what are the talks all about? 
the talks are about happiness in daily living. So what, why, why all of that talk? And the only reason is because those concepts, something that was said, <coughs> may be significant in changing the psychological self. So we're not talking about sports or gardening um, because, you know, talking about what vegetables are in season or what vegetables grow best in which soil and what have you is unlikely to make a difference to the psychological self. However, if we talk about certain dynamics, <clears throat> those dynamics link directly to the psychological self and the human condition. And so these talks are essentially about happiness in daily living, which is not available in the form that I'll describe, while the human condition is what it is. Because that human condition produces suffering. And what is happiness? Happiness is simply <clears throat> the end of suffering, the absence of suffering, the non-arising of suffering. So if happiness, which is being defined here as a very specific happiness, the end of suffering, which is what, what essentially that's saying is that happiness is not at all what we imagine with the word happiness. So now I'll introduce the word peace of mind and say, well, instead of using the word happiness, let's say peace of mind. But it is useful to know that that is the human happiness that we're all seeking. We're, we're really, we start off all saying, oh, I just want to be happy. But we think that happiness is when we don't have to struggle against certain things, certain circumstantial things. Um, and so we're convinced that our happiness that we are seeking is to be found in the form of various pleasures, circumstantial improvements, essentially. And so that's the direction that the human condition takes us in. Now, that isn't where the happiness that the Buddha was talking about will be found. In fact, he goes to extremes to describe it in a way that hopefully will um, land and say, oh, it's not that. Right? It is not um, happiness through the improvement of circumstance. So um, he described it in much the way that... Um, I'm describing it very simply, enlightenment is the end of suffering. The cause of suffering is desire. And the cause of desire is attachment to outcomes. Now, what that means in the context of what I've been saying is that suffering... Um, or the, the absence of, so enlightenment, is the end of suffering. The suffering is the human condition um, that we start off with, which is where the realization life is suffering comes from. So when uh, Buddha was the prince Siddhartha, um, living in very you know opulent um, fashion, uh, yet seeing a lot of poverty around him and having trouble reconciling this and also feeling an internal struggle and questioning about life. And um, that's when his seeking started and he left left the kin kingdom to to try and figure things out. And so he started off with this experience of suffering. And so that's the, where the, the first noble truth is, is life is suffering. And so then, okay, now that it's been seen that life is suffering, meaning, um, so let's also be clear, suffering does not mean pain. It doesn't mean breaking a leg or starving or being handicapped, um, being persecuted uh, by other groups. 
um, they're all very painful and unfor- unfortunate circumstances. Suffering, as I've been using it from the beginning of this talk and in all of the talks that I give, suffering talks about an uncomfortableness on the level of oneself. Um, and when we look at that, that uncomfortableness on the level of oneself is always because of the attitude to circumstance. And the attitude is not something we pick and choose although it might seem like it is, but the attitude stems out of our psychological self that was put in place by life, layering it on moment after moment after moment based on how our thinking happened, which is not something we do. It's something that happens because of a very complex billions and trillions of neurons that are firing at an amazing rate. And you and I don't do that as far as I know. I don't spend countless hours um, in fact, not countless hours, it would be a job that would require us to be doing nothing else in life if we had to control all of those neurons and um, what's going on. So, you know, that that's something that's happening and we get to experience it and we mistake the experience of all of that for the doing of it. Um, don't worry if that's happened to you. It's a human condition it's inevitable that's that's how we've been designed to not be the doers because it's happening because of an amazing um, architecture of biology and psychology and yet within that architecture um, that is happening and not our doing is this human condition that has been put in place that then makes us feel and think a certain way and have a certain attitude that is not in our control but it just arises and um, so the suffering is always attitudinal to circumstance and it can change but only when the multitude of forces in life bring about the required change. So, you see, all this talk about um, happiness, which turns out to be peace of mind, happiness through peace of mind. And what is peace of mind? Peace of mind is the absence of suffering, which is the unpeaceful mind, the resisting mind, the uncomfortableness, which r- really is, when we get down to the, the depth of the uncomfortableness, it is thought and feeling. Um, and So, as I was saying, the Buddha has said that enlightenment is the end of suffering. And then he goes on. So it's not the gaining of anything. It is just the where something that you've had previously is no longer there. It's a a relief. It's a a dropping off of a burden. Um, And he says the cause of suffering is desire and the cause of desire is attachment is attachment so how's that linked into what uh, how i was describing it okay so desire basically is the deeply ingrained notion that my happiness that fulfillment that the end of suffering is going to be found in getting something So we have the desire for whatever it is that we think we are missing. Soulmates, that's a big one, right? Money, that's another big one. Safety, that's another big one. Health, that's another big one. Um, So now these are all important things on a biological level. I'm not diminishing them in that regard. However, they're not where our happiness in the way that it actually is available will be found. Um, So it's not to say that those things are not important, but let's not mix them up with happiness. So when we do mix them up with happiness, so when 
we are convinced that our happiness is to be found in getting something that we don't have, which is the acquisition of something, the gaining, the adding on, so our backpack will get heavier by gaining a soulmate or by gaining more money. Um, when that's our idea, we are heading in that direction. We're looking for it. Our uh, efforts are towards it. And therefore, um, when we don't have it, we're going to feel like things aren't quite good enough yet. So I can't feel fulfilled because my idea of myself is I haven't quite got a full backpack yet. Um, and where does the... Um, desire so we're desiring the soulmate and that desire comes from the deeply ingrained as I said belief that that is where my happiness is to be found and that is what attachment refers to attachment refers to the psychological um, belief system which is part of the identity that is being put in place that says my happiness or who I am essentially who I am will be complete when I get something. So that's the human condition that was put in place. That's the identity. That So the identity is an attached identity, an identity that believes its existence, its completeness, its wholeness, its contentment, its fulfillment is dependent on something more that it doesn't have that it might get in the future. That's attachment. So if um, your car breaks down and there is a strong resistance of uncomfortableness that extends horizontally in time, then that is suffering. That is a result of one's attitude to the circumstance and that uncomfortableness is arising because there is an attachment that says my completeness is dependent on my car not breaking down. Um, that's just deductive reasoning. So if, if we understand the framework, when the uncomfortableness arises, we can maybe just look at it and say, okay, so this is confirmation that there is attachment, which means that my identity is saying that life has to turn out pleasure, 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 the way that I imagine that it needs to in order for me to feel complete. The alternative is where the car breaks down and there can be a momentary um, a biological pain, like a, a momentary frustration, and that's the biological response. However, um, horizontally, the suffering doesn't kick in because there is a connection to a core that is much deeper to the sense of self I've been speaking about. Um, so if this is kicked in, if the uh, psychological self has essentially um, become fairly weak and started to fall away or completely fallen away, what tends to replace it or present itself is something um, that is described as more absolute, less changing, um, more permanent, more real. And that is the consciousness that is the very base of the human condition, is the very core. Um, and if there is a grounding in that aspect of ourself, then the car is still going to break down. That grounding in um, the core of our being doesn't suddenly mean that circumstance becomes infallibly pleasurable. Circumstance is still going to unfold more or less the same way as it did, which means um, cars breaking down. And yet the thinking of what this means about me doesn't spiral into a story of woe and unfortunateness because there is always the returning back to, but let me not lose myself. As soon as there is a losing of oneself, if we've become familiar with this deeper core, it feels so uncomfortableness that it, that the uncomfortableness acts as a reminder to 
remember that what I am and to feel once it's become becomes accessible which is so this is why you know seeking can be very frustrating because if we have no access to this side of ourself if that hasn't revealed all of these words are just blah 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 um because the the seeker um has the experience of suffering and it's uncomfortableness it's uncomfortable and there is no um, glimpse or experience of anything other. And so all this talk about um, peace of mind, the end of suffering, uh, then in itself becomes an attachment, becomes something that the seeker craves because it sounds so great. Um, and that just becomes another thing, another expectation because we're now looking for peace of mind to put in the backpack because we don't have it. Um, and so that's where this whole topic started from. Life is suffering. If that is understood and accepted, um, which is not something you do, but um, if the acceptance happens where we just, where we hear it and we go, oh, life is by and large for the majority of people, um, including myself as a seeker, we would say, um, and we are not the doers of the suffering and we're not the doers who can change the neurology and the way that feelings arise and the identity. And if it, it's really not a, uh, it's not that complex a concept. If we, if it lands and we go, so that's it, nothing to do. Um, once again, if that's misunderstood, when that is put forward as a teaching, um, if it's put forward in an absolute sense, right, then people will find fault with it because on the other hand, the change happens because... Um, there is an engagement in certain things, but that can happen anyway. Um, a, once the attitude changes, we might still find ourselves engaging in these things. So the um, point where that I was making, where it's so important for us to really go, oh, so there's nothing for me to do that anything that I often a lot of the times when I'm trying to do something it's a resistance to suffering so that n notion that there's nothing to do is not meant to be some absolute um, understanding to be applied literally on all levels including sitting still on the couch because there's nothing to do. That would be a misunderstanding of what it's saying. Where it is valuable is where um, the realization cuts deeply into a movement that we might see in that moment, a movement that is the resisting of suffering and the, um, the, the, the effort, the strong effort to try and get away from it. And in that, in, if that's the movement, that's not earnest seeking, but that is rather um, a form of suffering. And so if we have heard that the human condition is suffering and that suffering is happening because of a very complex um, system that has been put in place by life moment after moment by you know the mystery of a sperm and an egg coming together and um, producing a blueprint that grows into a biological instrument that is conditioned and therefore functions like a biological robot including the production of thoughts and feelings and suffering pleasure pain all of that um, and so this realization that there is nothing to do. You can't do anything. 
that can be a great realization when applied specifically to a particular form of suffering, which is the suffering that is resisting the suffering that is inevitable from time to time in our life. And, you know, when it hits, it hits just so clearly where we, I've never, how many times have I heard that there is um, nothing, nothing you can do and have, and maybe we've never heard it in such a way that gets us to just stop, to surrender, to um, really acknowledge your suffering in all of its intensity instead of um, this hybrid of mm, pretending or, or um, hoping that it will end and and being so sure that if you try hard enough it will end um now if that's the earnest seeking part that is that that's not suffering that's earnest seeking and that's flow and that is um different to the uh movement of the resistance to the suffering so this this um this statement there's you know, nothing you can do because all the suffering is happening because of a firing of neurons in that moment. If it hits, it can lead for lead to surrender. And for some people, the surrender will be a surrender of being completely overwhelmed by a sense of grief at this being your life um, and and in a way despair but that what that would be if it happened in that moment would be a release of something that's there and yet um, this non-acceptance that this could be the rest of your life which you know is the last thing that the desperate seeker is going to want to admit and it's the 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 thing is it it is extremely possible that it will never change and this the the desperate seeking doesn't dare acknowledge that because it thinks that acknowledging it is somehow going to mean that is going to be the case. Whereas I suggest that if you acknowledge something, um, instead of trying to deny what is um, a very real potentiality, that is bound to lead to more fruitfulness. And so the acknowledgement that it might never change, that this is your life could lead to an outburst of um, emotions and grief that may actually um, be followed by a, a quietness because that load has been released from the system. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do this to get the quietness. If that's as soon as that becomes the mentality, that's attachment to outcome and not surrender. <laughs> so these things are unlikely to happen in this moment, but this thinking, the these seeds, can lead to a contemplation of your own um, about this topic, about any of the topics, and. In that contemplation, that's when a thought of the intellect, of the contemplating mind, might just sneak in and break up a certain belief where suddenly something hits home. Um, and yet, <laughs> that might never happen because life is suffering. So I'll take a couple of questions and, and 
we'll call it a night. Hello, Holger. Hello, Roger. So beautiful to um, listen to your clarity, to listen to the words and to feel the peace that comes from you. Mm, thank you. Nice to have you here. Yeah. <laughs> it's so nice. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. To me, uh, suffering uh, feels like a cocoon. And this makes sense to me and it feels good. I mean, then I'm not, then I don't need to be afraid of suffering. I don't need to push it away or something. I can allow it and I can have the understanding that at one point I outgrow it and it can drop away. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very fortunate if, um, because, you know, that to me, if that's, the capacity that is presenting itself for you um, where in that you're saying you don't have to be afraid of it, right? So that's saying that that is a capacity that you find available from time to time when the suffering is there. I, I guess that's why you're describing it this way. Um, if that's the case, when that's the case, that means that that's the equivalent of what I was describing at the beginning of the satsang where um, someone seeking has taken them down the track where essentially their um, their su structure is different and then is producing the suffering with a lack of fear component to it. So the suffering itself will have fear in it. Um, and then there is going to be, there's a part of it that is saying, actually, you don't have to be afraid of this. You can allow this to be, um, which is very different to how... Uh, the experience probably was before any um, seeking made its changes. And um, so uh, pr prior we would have this, you know, strong involvement in the suffering and resistance to the suffering and being overwhelmed by the suffering. So I think that uh, when you, and so I think it's very good f to be able to acknowledge also that, oh, this is, a happening what you described this capacity to allow it to be and to not be completely in resistance and afraid of it is an amazing move forward but it's not your doing it is the new um, expression of Holger which is a movement towards peace of mind Before, I always blamed myself for my own suffering. Mm. What, a mad, what a madness this is. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. It's wonderful. And I'm so grateful I found some uh, friends on Zoom, uh -huh. which, which are interested in non-duality. And uh, it's so beautiful and precious to talk with another human being who also has this love for truth and just to um, hear myself and to be able to ask questions and to just relax in the presence of another human being. This is such a gift. Mm. And thank you for introducing me to this. It's wonderful. Thank you, Holger. You're very, very welcome. Thanks for your kind words. Yeah. Um, I did want to point out um uh, something and it ties in with what Holger just said um, about this guilt where we blame ourselves um, for suffering um, and it was in relation to once again a way of hearing teachings um, in a way that don't get taken so literally because um, often teachings um, say things for good reason but then we hear them and take them absolutely and um, they can have some very awkward side effects and one of these things is in in relation to especially I think because the Catholic um, religion has a lot of guilt associated with it and wrapped up in it so there's a lot of Catholics not all Catholics but um, 
some people that have interpreted the rules, let's say, or the, the, the religion a certain way, carry a lot of guilt um, that they would say is put in place because of um, what is contained in the religion. Um, now, that's um, in itself not necessarily um, correct because they've received the religion in a particular way. It's not necessarily the religion. And furthermore, they've interpreted it a certain way, which is not necessarily how everyone will interpret it. Nonetheless, you do get this feedback that, um, uh, you know, from, I do get the feedback from time to time that um, I feel very guilty and I think it's got to do with being brought up as a Catholic. I, I don't feel guilty. I was brought up as a Catholic, so I'm just putting some context in in into this um but the point that i wanted to bring up is um where we are told don't judge the other god is the only one that can judge um and because religions um are often used not as they were necessarily intended um, or the core teaching was intended, but being used to um, get people to act a certain way or to control societies or whatever. Um, then when that is being, when that's the motive, certain aspects are emphasized in a certain, in a particular way that um, may not be what the core religion is, um, is getting at. Um, and so we look at this where we're told that God will judge and there are you know, certain parables and um, parts of, uh, of the teachings that talk about the end, of, you know, the end of time and how God, this man um, on a cloud, or will you know, judge people as having being good or bad in life and those that are good get to go to the right and those that are bad go to the left or up and down. Um, and so there can be a lot of fear, fear of God, the judging God. Um, and if you, Ramesh used to say, if you fear God, you can't love God. Um, and a, a lot of guilt because of how I have lived my life that is not in line with what um, God would like and therefore not only am I fearful but I feel guilty for not having uh, done well enough um, so this gets put in place however when we look at it, it we, and maybe we, I'm giving benefit of the doubt to the teaching but um, you know we spend our time judging the other blaming the other that's judging is blaming the other judging ourself blaming ourself for being good enough or not good enough that's what judgment is and and the, the religion is saying don't judge you don't have the entitlement to judge god will judge now if we don't take it literally maybe there is no god that will judge but the teaching is saying well i need to um <clears throat> introduce a God that is going to judge so that um, it can become clear to the seeker that it's not their role to judge because they don't have an omnis omniscient view, they don't have an understanding, they haven't walked a single mile in the boots of someone else. So how can one judge the other? Um, and so it's just a little funny when we look at how um, something like that statement, which on the one hand can be there to help us to act as, you know, God is the only one that can judge. Um, and that can be a, a reminder or a concept that arises whenever our judging, whenever we see ourselves judging the other or judging ourselves. And then this comes up to cut off our own judgment of ourself and the other, which is our suffering. And ironically, we hear it, some, some of us hear it, 
and say, oh no, God is going to judge us and then start feeling guilty. for. So that's the tragedy of um, life, which is why life is suffering. It's um, just the way these things happen and what to do. Um, so when I talk about religion, you know, as far as I, I don't think, someone asked me the other day, do I celebrate Easter? And I really don't see myself as um, religious or spiritual. I don't know what that means. I mean, outside of these talks um, and the thinking I do from time to time as to how um, to, you know, convey ideas in ways that may be useful, um, might bring about change. You know, attitudinally, I say, I all I can do is turn up, say what I say, the outcome completely out of my control. It's far too complex. I don't know how anyone hears what I'm saying. I mean, the, the, the likelihood and reality is that everyone who hears it, hears it through their ears, through their lens, doesn't hear a single um, word of what I am saying or what I am thinking. Um, and there's a full range of um, coming close to what I'm saying or hearing it and hearing it very differently to my intention and yet hearing it very differently to my intention can also lead to significant um, shifts. Um, I know that from my experience. I went to see Ramesh and for the first, I don't know, five weeks um, of going or maybe longer, I was convinced he was talking about the end of the ego, that um, liberation is the end of the ego. And so whenever he was talking, I was hearing, oh, he's talking about the end of the ego. He's talking about there is no person. Um, he's talking about the world is illusion. <laughs> um, because that's where my head was at when I transitioned into Ramesh's teaching. And the teaching actually says the ego will never die um, until the physical death of the body. The ego is not the problem. Now, we have to be clear on how the word ego in that teaching is being used, but he would say it over and over in, in terms of the concept, putting forward the concept. He would say the ego is not... The, the ego is the body-mind organism, the... Um, impersonal consciousness of source linked to a particular body-mind organism functioning through that body-mind organism. And that Ramana was an ego, Nisargadatta was an ego, Ramesh was an ego. We are all egos, and the ego is not the problem. The ego has to be there in order for us to live in daily life and function. Um, so the ego is essentially the vehicle and the consciousness, um, and we are all egos. The differentiation is that everyone is an ego. Most egos are egos that include the belief of personal doership and attachment to outcome. And some egos that have been sort of impacted by life and functioned a certain way in terms of their contemplation, the thoughts that arose, are then egos still, but without the belief in um, personal doership and attachment to outcome. And so what he was saying is, stop trying to kill the ego. Drop this idea that the ego is the problem and start seeing that what is really the problem is the attitude towards life the attitude based on the belief in personal doership, which we can call the attitude of doership, and the attitude based on the belief that my happiness is to be found in outcomes, which we can call the, the um, attitude of attachment. Um, and so the ego isn't the problem. The problem is this movement of thought that is in resistance to the flow of life, which is very often not just pleasure. Um, and that resistance is an attitude that says, but I need life to be pleasure, pleasure, pleasure. And the attitude of personal doership that blames the other for delivering certain outcomes and blames oneself for those outcomes. And so uh, what 
I've just described, which is what Ramesh says, is the ego doesn't die except at physical death. But what dies is the belief in personal doership, which was all everything I was saying at the beginning of the um, talk, which is these deeply ingrained belief systems. Um, now, a lot of tradition, a, diff, a, a lot of other teachings will use the word ego um, to describe that which is problematic. The problem that got put in place, which is why Ramesh pointed this out, is that we then have the belief in personal doership trying to kill itself. Um, and it ends up going round. So the, the doer takes on a task of killing itself, which by taking on that task of killing itself, it's keeping itself alive. And so in order to um, uh, address that problem, we can introduce, for those people whose um, affinity is for, or for the intellect to be part of the seeking, we can introduce a concept that maybe prevents that um, problem from happening. And that is to say, no, the body, the, the biological entity is always going to be here. That Buddha continued to live for 90 years as an ego, but without the belief in personal doership, without attachment to outcome. How do we know that? Because he said that enlightenment is the end of suffering. The cause of suffering is desire, and the cause of desire is attachment. So it is the attitude of attachment, the identity that is the attached identity that dissolves. Right? And how do we know that he didn't see himself as a doer? Because he said, events happen, deeds are done, consequences happen, but there is no individual doer thereof. Saying life is a happening, not my doing, not your doing. Ramana, um, in one of his main overriding concepts, says everything happens according to the great ordainer. The body functions according to its design and its karma. It means the body um, is part of what is happening because of the great ordainer. The body is part of the predetermined unfolding of life. He goes on to say that whatever is meant to happen, no matter what force in the universe tries to make it not happen, it will still happen. And whatever is destined not to happen, no matter what force in the, in the universe tries to make it happen, it will not happen. And with this understanding that life is a happening, that it is going to unfold one way, there is not much to talk about. No shoulds or shouldn'ts, this shouldn't be like this, that I should have done that, why did this happen that way? Why are there um, handicapped children? Why is there so much injustice in the world? There's nothing, none of that is to talk. There's, there's not, nothing to talk about. Because if we understand it's all happening, not according to me, not according to you, but because of the great ordainer, which is life, then the answer is because of life, because that's life. Oh, it's run out. Okay. So I think um, we'll take another question or so. Uh, just need to get a cable so that I can hear what you guys are asking.
Hi, Peter. Oh, hey, Roger. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, welcome. Although uh, sometimes, especially uh, as I have a question in mind and then listening to you talk or other um, other people asking questions sort of often dissolves that question. So I wonder why I'm asking it, but I've had my hand up. So anyway, um, <laughs> I'll spare you the preamble. I'll just go ahead with the question anyway. Um, um, I guess it, it goes back to this notion, which was sort of a fairly revolutionary radical idea of, for me, um, somebody who's, who's operated on a lot of shoulds and shouldn'ts, the idea of doing, doing what you feel. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, I, I, I went through a phase, I think after hearing that where I was just, because I've, I've even had, uh, I even struggled for a long time even to know or to identify what it is that I feel. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I think that maybe had something to do with this, again, um, this tendency to you know, feel, you know, like I should should do something one way or another. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Or this uh, shoulds and shouldn'ts again. And um, so uh, I was wondering, uh, the then, then I was wondering, also you talk about, you know, seeking pleasure, 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 and... Um, trying to uh, avoid pain that that tendency we have um, uh, and I was wondering isn't um, um, doing what you feel sort of a, a form of seeking pleasure in a sense because mm -hmm. you're doing I mean what else what else is feeling or doing what you feel other than um, aren't you operating on the basis of some form of pleasure ultimately and how does that um yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I even i question oh. my own questions and no no it's a, it's <laughs> anyway, a, the sincerity of my own yeah it's a good question but, and there's a good answer for it i mean i why, why it's a good question is because there's a nuance um that we need to understand and that is that the biological aspect of the body <clears throat> is always going to move towards pleasure and away from pain um mm -hmm. because mm -hmm biologically we have our preferences so we will always move towards what is pleasurable for our preference the difference is when we talk about seeking pleasure um, what that's referring to is the attitude of attachment to outcomes the attitude that says my happiness is to be found in outcomes um, and that's very different to the biological movement towards pleasure in the moment um, that attachment to outcome attitude is something that is looking into the future, expecting, um, wanting life to turn out a certain way, worrying about the future, looking into the past, um, having, you know, regretted certain outcomes, uh, complaining in the present about what's happening. Um, so there's a very big difference between the biological will... If you know you're in a at a party and someone comes around with a tray of food and you're hungry, the biological will reach out and take something off the tray and it will pick what it prefers. Um, if, however, someone swoops in and takes what you were about to pick up, um, by the biological reaction might be momentarily upset, as in damn, that's what I wanted, and horizontally in time does not have a story about what that means about itself. So um, for clarity's sake, you can even drop off the momentary biological reaction of disappointment, the, the very biological um, disappointment. Let's leave that out of it. So the biological moves towards what it wants but it doesn't know how to resist not getting what it wants right it doesn't have this capacity to go into the psychological thinking about 
what missing out on the food means and then blaming the person that sort of snuck in um, when they could see that that's what you were going wanting or whatever. That's all the psychological. And the biological always moves towards pleasure. However, it sort of is full of wisdom because it's not full of the um, lack of understanding that the psychological thinking has. And so it basically um, doesn't get caught up in um, insisting on certain outcomes actually coming to fruition. And yet it's going to do its best all the time to get pleasure. Um, and the truth is that the biological movement towards pleasure is part of the biological layer and it's very important otherwise we um, wouldn't survive very well um, and it isn't the cause of suffering so we need to be able to see the difference between the biological movement and the psychological craving right okay yeah I, I think I sort of had a, sort of <laughs> knew the answer in a sense that you were but uh, it's, it's good to hear it. I guess keeps hammering it, hammering it in. Yeah. Good. <laughs> All You're right. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. You're welcome. Okay, we'll just take these questions with the hands up, and um, so I think two more. Hi, RT. Hi, Roger. Hello there. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you for making these teachings available. My um, pleasure. My question, uh, like the previous person mentioned, has evolved because I had a, a question. But anyway, um, what you've talked about this morning was so rich and compelling to, to me. And it brought me to a point that was a shock in a way to my system. Um, you talked about ego again, and I've been on this <clears throat> path of <laughs> the ego trying to end the ego. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you brought me to the point this morning with listening to you, I came to, to the realization that, or to the truth, to another, a new truth that kind of shocked my system. I'm, I'm a little bit in shock now. Um, to the realization that what I've been doing is not is not working, and it's not it's not true. Mm. This is a new truth to me, and, and I started put my hand down because I felt like I didn't need to ask the question, but I felt like I needed to. perhaps share with you mm. and there's this ego oh, that you can help me the, the help transcend yeah the help's oh, already oh, happened yeah okay the help's already happened and it's not even i'm not saying i have helped you but the help happened when you realized it because it's like what that realization was was the realization of a form of suffering that was going unnoticed right a, a form of functioning that was essentially a maintaining of the belief in doership um and and the funny one of the ego trying to kill itself and so now whenever that arises it's going to get caught out it's going to be seen so um that's the beauty of so i'm glad you came on because i can i can sense that what happened was a clear seeing on your side of the error that was being perpetuated. Um, and that's hugely significant. It, it's not that, you know, one is enough because we need to have those insights in regard to all of the different unseen forms of suffering. Um, but when that happens, that's what is referred to as grace, in my opinion, where something very beneficial has happened. Yes. And you know it wasn't you doing it, but rather it happened because the universe conspired in that moment for 
um, you know, the words to be delivered and for them to land a particular way because you easily in another moment can hear the same words and the click doesn't happen. So this is, uh, this is very good and I wouldn't be surprised that, uh, you know, once that kicks in and starts um, changing the movement, then there's all sorts of follow-on, flow-on effects, a bit like getting a, a couple of numbers in Sudoku. <laughs> um, you then suddenly have a whole lot of opportunities to, to finish the puzzle. Yeah. You mentioned grace, and um, that hit me strong this morning too, because when you were talking about, and you can tell me if I'm wrong about this, when you were mentioning, I don't know. Mm -hmm. And I feel like grace figured into that for me because um, that, that word came up and that, that it, it resonated with me. The word grace suddenly was that I don't know. Mm. I don't know in this. And in a space that I perceived as grace because i don't know that, that usually that, happens when the predominant um the predominant default is i definitely know <laughs> um so if if that's the if that's the standard and then something clicks where we realize actually i don't know <laughs> it hits in the way that you described Okay. Thank you so much, Roger. Mm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. You're very welcome. Pleasure. Hi, Jaris Law. Hello, Roger. Hello. How are you today? I'm very well. And you? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah, I'm, I'm well. Hey, can can I put my camera on? Uh, yes, I'm sure we'll figure that out. Okay. Okay, so I'm waiting. I'm still waiting. <laughs> okay. So great, I, I, I need to wait for great Oidena to let me. To let me uh, I think you can do it now. Oh, oh yeah, great Oidena was merciful for me. Okay. Hello, Roger. Hello, hello. So, thank you for your talk today. You're welcome. I had, I had some uh, moment with my emotion today. I realized some like despair, and I was crying because I like deeply accept because of your speech the pain from the past, and that I I couldn't do anything about this, and the whole ego str struggle was like just ego. <laughs> so it was mm. thank you thank you for, for, for your pointings about because I'm, I'm glad um, thanks to you I meet I meet, I, I meet my pain. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you for deepening, deepening my understanding. Thank you. I thought you were going to say thank you for so, deepening so your much. pain. <laughs> but it, I think that the, it's like connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is like, as you say, the story is already written. So when in the story is the pain, so you need to pay the pain. <laughs> so That's right. It's so much right. So it, when when this my my like this for this body is the is um, turn to take pain. So it, it like I I, I just can surrender for, for that and and see that this is all God and and be grateful for 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 the for. The, what he or she or, or whatever can show me through this about maybe it will be epi epiphany, some, some like some like aha moment, but it would be just peace and and 
okay, so that is the experience. So maybe somebody needs to be happy. And at this moment, in this side, it can it need to be like suffering. So, mm -hmm. so okay, so this is like so when you know, because this is the story, whole, whole story. So maybe maybe it was like that. Sometimes I I maybe you you you, you share with me this this this, this Roger understanding that because you 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 were talking about ego. So do, do you agree that uh, ego like uh, can turn to to the happy one when uh, he or it or the structure that is there is there is the realization that 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 all ego are like the part of one. And 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 mm, so and so the best way <laughs> when you when you are the the part of the one like like the part in the engine in car is to serve the, the whole so it's like I like maybe maybe like that what 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 what, what? um yes the that. I, I um, one of the ways I like to say it, which is how Ramesh used to say it, is that um, a happy ego um, recognizes its its unbroken connection to source. Right? Um, so the happiness is a result of one's unbroken connection to source, and the unbroken connection to source is where we. Um, feel grounded in and aware of awareness, our own awareness, the awareness that is aware of the changing content, is aware of the pleasure and the pain, aware of the suffering even. Um, and so if there is that awareness, then awareness of the awareness that is aware of life. And maybe we have a sense that that awareness is source. Um, and another aspect that means we are always connected to source is to understand that we don't do anything. So the speaking is happening because source is functioning through us. The seeing is happening because source is functioning through us. The thinking is happening because source is functioning through us. And so if this is a recognition that we have, then we know that whenever I am, when I am breathing, when I am speaking, when I am thinking, when I am seeing, hearing, when I am aware, it is because I am not disconnected from source. I am only able to function because source is functioning through me. Um, so it is, it is actually source having the human experience. Um, and so that so, is our connection. Yeah. So when when the when the love is happened, it's not my love. It's the love of God or the God. Uh, say that again. When love happens. Yeah, because you, you said beautifully about all the the like the, the goodness, qual some qualities you mentioned, like like. Uh, you order what some qualities and and, and i i like feel like the the thought was happened but when when for example when you see the child and you see like instantly smile for the this ch children because it's like it makes in you the connection this connection that with the whole Okay, you freeze. You are freeze now. Yeah, I can see you. Okay, okay, I see you again. Okay, okay, so so w when the connection is happened because you see the, like the innocence of child, like the, this this. So and and in, in, for for example, in the heart of mother, but also in in like every in other people, people see like love. Because I think you know there is like this this truth which you said about. So my question is: this love? It's not like love, like for person ego. Mm -hmm. It's just 
the yeah. love of God, yes? Or, or, or yeah. No? Well, you see, this is in the Indian tradition, the namaste, you know. And even in the Western traditions, the, when we pray, it's the same hand gesture. But the namaste is the spirit in me recognizes the spirit in you. And I think that um, when we, s in children, it's easier to see that they are being lived by a force that is less, um, much less of the ego force. Uh, well, I, I, let me not use the word ego force here because then I'm mixing things up. Much less of the doership um, and attachment to outcomes when they're in the moment playing or they just smile. Or it's, it's easier to see that the essence that is shining through and that hopefully reminds us of our own essence. Um, so maybe that's what you were referring to. Yeah, yeah, you, 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 you have me. Thank, thank you, Roger. So the last question, because I have some uh, math lesson with children, so so I need to be like uh, in order and in in like this relative life like, work. Okay, as well, not only in like for area and you know mm -hmm. what I mean. So my my question is, is about this uh, like virtue because you said that. The, for example, you, you you create this example in the in the banquet. You you see this the tray with some food and some goodness and biological. We we can like like there will be movement for to pick one or other. But my my question is, when when we don't have like the the structures from the like from the heart from the understanding that we we want to like serve the God or create something good. We, we like we can go like for like want to for God create the the virtue the the structure which which will be more helpful for the whole and then we can like for for example in the in the tray where there will be some chocolate and usually when we don't have like plan or some some move movement like the direction in life we can like take one chocolate another chocolate and the belly rise so. So my question is that, the, so the, for what from your side is the role of, of virtue and to have the direction in your life? Because clearly to have the direction in your life like um, makes, uh, like influence the day, day, day by day choice, which, and even this biological one, we, which we can like have different when when there is an absence of this like movement. Mm. So, um, I would say that uh, when we hear about virtues, they are delivered as a concept, right? Uh, we hear about them when we are young children, for example, and then we move towards trying to make ourselves like that, right? So it becomes. A should your parents will tell you you should be patient you should be kind you should be honest you should be thoughtful you should be whatever um, and they might even put that into a, uh, you know instead of you should be just in normal daily living they'll give you some parables of virtue and talk about virtue as being something very special and um, and so then we have this idea that we will work towards. Now, to me, that is not virtue. That as soon as that is how we are working towards virtue, it is the opposite of virtue. Um, so I think you f can forget about virtue. In fact, if you are thinking about virtue, um, ironically, it is the opposite of virtue. And this is, in a way, I think it's um, uh, when they talk about the righteous in in some in religion. The righteous are those that are trying to be good, or think you know they are good because they do certain actions, and then they have a this pride about their goodness. And so that means their goodness is not really pure goodness or virtue. Um, so 
I would say forget about virtue. Do what you feel like, which sounds very selfish and sounds like it will be um, really bad for society and whatever. Whereas I say, if you start to feel, what do I feel like? What's happening is you're moving out beyond the shoulds and shouldn'ts. And true virtue doesn't get to shine through shoulds and shouldn'ts. And okay, so, so you, mm-hmm. I'm sorry. So you tell it this because when I talk, you, when I hearing, listen to you, Roger, I can say that in you in your like structure, I see like the very like big trust for the life. So it's like I don't need to like be worried about this. I'm just trust that yeah, you, you have deep, you have like deep understanding. That's why. So what? Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Roger, um, um, because as you see, I'm a little bit in in high in like, stress. So maybe la- last question, because you said this side is always again, again. Maybe you need, maybe I want need to one point from you one one more again. So this this like um, this motion that you you always said that like even like 100 years ago, there always need to be some evil like. Like good and evil, and I am like, like rebellious about why, why? Because my point is, when something happens, something wrong. Okay, we see. We, for example, children is kidnapped, but it's real, not just thought. It's real. So, so the the, the, the whole like movement is okay. Help, help the children, but I don't understand that why people in television, and that's why I don't watch television and like. Talking about stuff, wrong stuff, which even the, they are not real yet. So, so it's for me it's like stupidity. Like, for, like maybe I'm judging now. Yeah, I'm judging now. So, okay, thank you. <laughs> but, but uh, yes. So, 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 the, so it's the, my point. The reason is there so, doesn't have to be. There doesn't have to be evil. So, so, so sorry, I, I'm, not, I, I'm the, uh, My interruption is the, the last one, I think. So, what do you think? So. In human, on on all this structure, we need like, like in our narration, our seeing this 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 part of like the the bad one, like the the, the Lucifer. Like we need we need this part to 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 make the the part of whole going on. No, I don't. I don't necessarily say we need it, but I say it's there. Um, you know, we just need to see. There are six, eight billion people. Now, eight billion people. Um, you know, to expect everyone to be good um, is unrealistic, Mm -hmm. unless, of course, the manifestation creates everyone as good. Now, at the moment, the manifestation hasn't created everyone as good. It has created um, what we can call a world of duality, where there is interconnected opposites, health, disease, wealth, poverty, kindness, unkindness. Um, and so with that v- variety of people, 8 billion people, it just is unrealistic to imagine everyone being good unless <clears throat> we say, well, everyone will be good if the manifestation creates everyone as good. And so the way, th- because there are unkind acts that happen at the moment, we can say that's because the manifestation has created life to be duality at the moment, um, so, and so, it's a, so you particularly sorry, I, I sorry, particularly you said that that we all like in this understanding we like in the God is like in the camp, and more suffering, suffering like do eyes, and then maybe maybe it will be some grace. Okay, enough for God in in the people or in the in the whole world. So because like. The you, you know because in religion in, in Jesus Christ we say that that we don't need to suffer because like we just to be like uh, honor and see and thankful for the for the Christ to to take this all our sins so then we don't need to be like like doing for for, for ourselves but, and so mm-hmm. yeah, please continue. Um, yeah. uh, yes, well, you know, as I said, all. Teachings, religions, they are methodologies. So um, in a way, when a teaching, when a religion says 
Jesus will um, take away your sins. Basically, the sin means misunderstanding. Um, if we don't take it literally, uh, that's the, ep the the origin of the word sin is error. Um, so to me, it's the misunderstanding. And really, why will Jesus take it away? Well, he came with a teaching of understanding. You know, don't judge your neighbor, treat your neighbor as you would like them to treat you, and so on and so on. Um, and essentially, if you look at that, it's a way of getting you to relax, a way of getting you to surrender. Um, it's saying you can leave it up to someone else. It's not your job. Now, I don't believe there is Jesus that is going to um, take away your suffering or your sins or your misunderstanding unless you're listening to the teachings of Jesus. If you're listening to the teachings of Jesus and they impact you in a certain way, then the suffering can fall away. Um, so, so I need to like, like be, be in this dialogue with you because you always said when you talk about religion like in Christian that you, you like, I think you you like duplicate this understanding that oh the god is in christian is the, the one on the cloud and, and like like apart from us and i think all the realization and in, in the religious one is like like the muhammad the jesus and this like remembering that is in us. and when when you like see like in front of like in like like the image so so kill the image. It's not about image. Mm -hmm. It's about to be, to see that, that like, yeah, the, the marathon going. <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Yeah, no, yeah. I, I, to me, um, I, I have trouble seeing in religion the dualistic, literal um, descriptions. I, I don't hear that. I hear what... Um, I agree with you that at the core we can see the non-dual teachings in all the religions. Um, uh, when I say all, let's, um, I'm sure there are bits and some that aren't, but you know the major religions, Islam and uh, Christianity and Judaism, Hinduism, um, uh, and any other, th they all have their mystical you know, Rumi and Hafiz and um, St. John of the Cross. And they, they, there's a lot of mysticism that um, talks about the oneness. What I'm talking about, the God on the cloud, is not really the religion, but when um, institution has got hold of religion to control or the actual devotee of the religion that hears it very literally and then has an idea of God as a man on a cloud, you know, because heaven is up in the clouds, according to some people's um, hearing of the religion. So I, I don't think it's the religion itself, but um, uh, the tendency of certain descriptions uh, can, for some people, mean that it gets taken very literally. So, on that note... Thank you. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, I think uh, it's good night and peace. See you next week. <laughs>